10 hot takes about multiple sclerosis. Number one, vitamin D does absolutely nothing. Although there's very strong evidence for a correlation between low vitamin D and risk of MS, and this study showed that people with MS who have low vitamin D accumulate more new lesions, there's absolutely no convincing evidence that actually taking a vitamin D supplement is beneficial for MS in any way. In fact, this is data from Cochrane's evidence-based reviews showing that five randomized controlled trials failed to show any benefit of vitamin D supplementation, a result that has been recapitulated by further more modern studies. Why is this the case? Well, maybe it's a matter of confounding. Perhaps the real factor at play is ultraviolet radiation exposure, which is beneficial in MS and also incidentally raises vitamin D levels in the blood. But regardless, taking the pill doesn't seem to do anything. Now you can take vitamin D. It has an excellent safety profile at reasonable doses. I even take it myself, maybe just in case, and it may have other health benefits, but it should not be regarded as a treatment of MS. Number two, MS drugs aren't really that effective. Although modern high efficacy disease modifying therapies are excellent at preventing new MRI lesions and relapses, in terms of preventing long-term accumulation of disability, the data are less robust. For instance, this is data from the Oratorio study, Ocrevus versus placebo in primary progressive MS, and Ocrevus did achieve a statistically significant reduction in disability progression, but only by 24%. Not exactly a home run, and the risks have to be weighed carefully against the benefits, in my opinion. Another example is the EXPAND study, data shown here. This is Mazent versus placebo in secondary progressive MS. Again, Mazent was effective, but only reduced disability progression by 21%. Again, not a home run. Number three, the outcomes of clinical trials are dumb. Why are we even talking about disability progression anyway, a sort of arbitrarily defined metric? Why not just show me the average disability at the beginning and the end of the study in both the Ocrevus and placebo groups so I can get a sense of the real effect? How much disability are we actually preventing? And the EDSS, or Expanded Disability Status Scale, isn't a great outcome anyway. This is a measure of disability in MS used in research, it's highly biased in favor of lower extremity function or walking ability and doesn't really reflect cognitive function or upper extremity function very well, and it should be replaced with composite outcomes such as the MS functional composite. Number four, randomized blinded trials aren't necessarily actually blind. For example, for the drug Limtrada, when it was getting FDA approved, the FDA was reluctant to approve it because one of the side effects, infusion reactions, actually occurred in 100% of people. And the problem with this is you instantly know whether you're getting the drug or saline when you're in the infusion center. Obviously, if you get hives and wheezing, you're getting Limtrada. If nothing happens to you, obviously you're getting saline. And this can really affect how people report their symptoms. And even optimism and the placebo effect can be quite significant. In fact, I was a fellow at USC and I was a raider in these trials. And I remember I went to evaluate a patient. I'm supposed to be a blinded raider. And I saw that the patient had disseminated shingles and infection all over their body. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, are they getting Limtrada, an immunosuppressant known to cause disseminated disseminated shingles, or have they been randomized to Rebif, an MS disease modifying therapy that does not weaken the immune system? Hmm, I wonder if this could bias my assessment of the EDSS. Number five, there's limited research data on older individuals with MS and those with more advanced disability. For example, in the Oratorio study I mentioned earlier, again, this is Ocrevus versus placebo in primary progressive MS, they excluded individuals over age 55. They weren't allowed to enter the study. Also, the average age in this study was only around 44 to 45. So how do we know the drug actually works in a 70-year-old with MS, which is a lot of people with MS because it's not, generally speaking, a terminal illness? What about people with advanced disability? This same study excluded people over EDSS of 6.5, meaning you had to at least be able to walk with a walker. 
but what about people with MS who have very limited mobility? We need research data on older people with MS and people with more advanced disability. They have to be allowed to enter clinical trials so we can actually assess the benefits versus the risk and make good evidence-based recommendations. Number six, Me Too drugs are pointless. Often in MS, we have numerous drugs that do the same thing. For example, this is a list of drugs that kill B lymphocytes, with many more to come. This is a list of sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor modulators. This is a list of fumaric esters. Perhaps I'm being hyperbolic here. There may be some benefit to multiple agents in the same class. After all, people can have allergic reactions other intolerances, but after a certain point, it gets a little ridiculous, and our resources would be better spent looking for novel agents that work in different ways. Number seven, routine screening MRI scans are overrated. Certainly, MRI is excellent to help make a diagnosis of MS, and there was a time when screening MRI scans were great because a lot of people on low-efficacy disease-modifying therapies often had breakthrough lesions even in the absence of clinical attacks and this could guide therapy. And of course, they have a use today in people off disease-modifying therapy or on people on low-efficacy therapies for whatever reason. But in a stable individual on a highly effective disease-modifying therapy, the yield is very low and we should probably be doing them less often. Number eight, no one can accurately predict the long-term prognosis of someone with MS. For someone newly diagnosed 20 or 30 years old with MS, no one can tell you how you're going to be doing decades later. Sure, there are some correlations. People with optic neuritis tend to do better on average than people with transverse myelitis with significant weakness or bladder problems. People who accumulate moderate disability early in the disease tend to do worse than people who accumulate minimal disability or no disability earlier in the disease, but these are just correlations. I have many patients who have aggressive onset MS who stabilize and do well for a long time, and others who have minimal symptoms early on but develop progressive MS and decline midway through their life. Unfortunately, predicting the future in MS is a fool's game. It's just impossible. Number nine. Part of the improvement in the prognosis of MS in the modern era is due to better and earlier diagnosis of MS rather than the effect of our disease-modifying therapies. You may find this presentation to be cynical, but one piece of good news I have for you is that MS is, at least on the average, getting milder. For instance, this publication from 1983 showed that after 10 years of follow-up, about a third of people with MS were using a cane, but this publication from 2016 at the University of California, San Francisco, the MS EPIC study showed that in people with relapsing onset MS after 10 years, only 4.7% needed a cane. Granted, this is not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. In the first study, some people may have had progressive onset MS, which on average carries a worse prognosis. But overall, and in many other studies I'm not talking about here, there is a clear improvement of the prognosis. And indeed, part of this is due to the effect of disease-modifying therapies, but part of it is just better MRI scans, greater availability of MRI scans, doing them in people with milder clinical syndromes, and changes in the diagnostic criteria of MS that make MS easier to diagnose earlier. Number 10, it's better to be lucky than good. Although I talk a lot on this channel about lifestyle, nutrition, disease-modifying therapy, which I really do believe makes a difference, I still think it's better to just be lucky with multiple sclerosis because there's so much variation in the severity of the disease. And I have patients who have had MS for decades, have never taken disease-modifying therapy, don't keep any specific diet, and do extremely well, and I have other patients who seem to be making all the right choices and still have a lot of problems. Not to say that these things make no difference, but the variation in the natural history of the disease is so significant that it's ultimately better to just be lucky and have milder MS than anything I can do for you, at least in 2023. Maybe it will be different in the future. So let me know what you think of my list, and let me know if you have any hot takes about MS in the comments below, and give suggestions for future videos.